Alright. Uh, well, time for the third lecture. Um, so, uh, the previous lecture, I uh, basically focused the entire time on introducing generalized probabilistic theories, or GPTs for short, and how they are a very general framework for, um, for uh, studying alternative physical theories, alternative subquantum theories. And we saw that it basically boils down to, for every physical system, we associate it on unit space, um, and then the effects are a subset of the effects on unit space, and the states are a subset of the states on unit space. And the states are then the linear maps from one unit space to the real numbers. Uh, and introduce some concepts of uh, coarse grading, so we take addition of effect, uh, finite tomography, which boils down to these. Um, or the space being finite dimensional, and local tomography, which uh, says that if there's a composite system, the dimension of the composite system should be the product of the dimensions of the, of the, of the separate systems. Uh, okay, and what I want to do in this lecture is, um, uh, is use the GPT framework to go through some modern <coughs> reconstructions of quantum theory, so that they impose some additional um, principles and then from those principles, they then derive that uh, the unit spaces must be the self operators in the complex global space. Um, uh, after that, I want to look at what, uh, yeah, what I call partial reconstruction. It's not, very, it's not a very good name, but basically, if you only impose some principles, but not enough to fully capture quantum theory, then you can often already derive many properties that we consider to be like specific to quantum. And it sort of shows that those things aren't special to quantum theory, they're just general features of any non-classical theory. Um, yeah, and this last point, I don't think we're going to make it in time, I think it's going to be the next lecture, but uh, I want to sort of go through a, a reconstruction of theory of my own. Uh, yeah, let's start with uh, going through some of these reconstructions. Oh, this is a, a wrong slide. Um, anyway, um, so I want to go through three, four reconstructions. Um, and the first three are quite similar, and the fourth one is quite different. Um, so this is basically the paper that started it all, like the modern approach and like the GPT approach to quantum reconstructions. It's Lucian Hardy's quantum theory from five reasonable axioms. I would argue they're not super reasonable, um, and they've been improved upon in these later papers. So I'm just going to make show this to because it's in, it's uh, allows me to introduce some useful concepts that are used in these other papers. But like I'm not arguing that these are good axioms for quantum theory or that they're very natural or anything. Um, and then these other papers are uh, included because they're, I think, the most popular ones in terms of amount cited and the amount that I hear people talking about. Um, and like, they are definitely more natural axioms than the ones used here. And the fourth one I basically want to talk about because it's uh, quite nice from a mathematical <coughs> stand standpoint. And also, uh, they're just very different than these first three. Okay, so. What, what I want to do with each four of these is I just I first introduce all the axioms and then it still might not be clear what they actually mean and then I then I go through them one by one and sort of explain what they actually mean. Okay, so let's start with the first one. So Hardy has five axioms. Um, the first one basically boils down to we are using the GPT framework because like he basically invented it for the purpose of reconstructive quantum theory, so he still stated this as sort of an axiom uh, that the, the other papers just use as sort of a framework. Um, uh, the second one says that the tomographic dimension of the system is a function of the informational dimension. I'm going to define what informational dimension means later. And this function takes a minimal value consistent with the axioms, which you can already see is not a very nice axiom, but it is uh, useful. <laughs> okay, axiom 3 is, I'm not going to read it, but it basically says that um, if I have a state that's sort of restricted to a subsystem, then I can just, then this thing acts like a lower dimensional system. Um, I'm not going to say much about it for this reconstruction because the next reconstruction has a more natural way to phrase this and it's basically an improved version of this action. So I'm not going to say much about this here. Uh, and action four basically says that the theory sets out local tomography and there's also like a local tomography for informational dimension. So the informational dimension multiplies as well over the composite system. We're going to explain what that later. And axiom 5 says, um, between any two pure states of the system, we can find a continuous family of reversible transformations that maps one into the other. I'm also going to say more about what that means. Okay, so these are the five axioms he uses to reconstruct quantum theory. Okay. Okay, so first, like, I want to go towards informational dimension, what that means. 
So if we have a collection of states, just on set of states, we call these perfectly distinguishable if there exists a single measurement uh, that, well, perfectly distinguishes them. So um, <laughs> that like each of these measurement outcomes sort of uh, points towards which of these states it is. So if you know that your, state is a, that your system is in one of these states, you can do this measurement and you, then you perfectly know in which state this thing is. Okay? Uh, we define the informational dimension to be the maximal size of such a set of perfectly distinguishable states. Okay. And uh, the reason we call this informational dimension is because um, perfectly distinguishable states are sort of classical in a sense. And like, suppose we have two perfectly distinguishable states. That if I just label one to be the, the state zero and the other state one, then I can sort of encode a classical bit in there. Okay. And the same thing with the informational dimension is five. I can I have like a five-dimensional classical system with my subsystem of the thing. So the informational dimension is the largest classical system I can perfectly encode into this physical system. It's basically the idea. Um, I think it's one data Yeah. Oh, this is the. What's it? The B is one data yeah, yeah, like that would be the case for a C-star abstract. Yeah. The dimension of the largest computer set of them. So the informational dimension can arrive as IA, and to uh, contrast it with the tomographic dimension, so TA, this is the dimension of ordinary space. So this is the amount of uh, elements you measure which you need to perfectly capture uh, all the states, to perfectly distinguish all the states. Um, okay, and then so what, what does Axiom 2 says with this, these definitions? It says that for any system A, so there's a single function for the theory, it's just that for every system A, the informational dimension is related to the tomographic dimension in this manner. And if there's multiple options for F, given our restriction, then we pick the smallest one. So it's not super like natural, but like, it works. Uh, so examples. If I have classical theory, so more the space is just uh, the real numbers uh, to the power, then the informational dimension and the tomographic dimension, they match and they're just equal to N. If I have quantum theory, so I have complex matrices, complex self matrices, then the informational dimension is equal to the dimension of my Hilbert space, and the tomographic dimension is the square of that. Okay. In real quantum theory, it's again equal to the dimension of my Hilbert space, informational dimension. The tomographic dimension is now this, uh, yeah, this, this thing. Okay. Okay, so uh, uh, is, this, is this clear? What the, what the informational dimension is perfectly distinguishable and why you would want to care about this stuff. Okay. So, um, yeah, action three is again, I'm not going to say much about it, just to say that this is a, uh, <coughs> what I call a filter type system, because it allows you to um, filter a larger system to a smaller system, and it allows for proof, like in terms of the proof, it allows you to reduce questions about high dimensional systems to questions about low dimensional systems. Uh, and that like, makes it, your life a whole lot easier. So many reconstructions have a thing that does this, where like, you can sort of filter through a small system. Again, it should be clearer in the next reconstruction. Um, okay, and actually 4 says, for all systems A and B, the tomographic dimension multiplies over, over the subsystems, and the informational dimension as well. So uh, this is just local tomography, and this says that um, you can't encode uh, more classical information in a composite system than you can do in some, in some of its parts. Okay. Uh, now for the last axiom, I need to note another definition. So uh, for a complex set, we call an element extreme when, it, when uh, any way to write this complex combination just gives it itself. So uh, just to have some intuition, if I have a Square, the square is a complex set, of course. My extreme points would be the points on the side here. Well, if I have a sphere, like this filled sphere, then the extreme points are all the points on the outside of the circle. Okay? And if I have something more complicated like this, then extreme points are all these things, but not these things. Because if I have a point here, I can write this as a convex combination of these two points, right? So, uh, the extreme points of the state space, we call pure states. And that corresponds to the notion of pure state in quantum theory as well. If you take the state space to be the density of the layers. Um, and like in, in, a, in a sense, you can say that these are the real states of your theory, and the rest just comes from 
classical uncertainty about which state you've prepared. <coughs> okay, so we say GPT satisfies pure transitivity, <coughs> but for every pair of pure states, you can find a reversible transformation that maps one into the other. Okay, so this says that there's sort of like a max, like um, if you only look at pure states, it's sort of a maximally symmetric thing. There's no preferred direction for your pure states. You can just map everything, to rotate everything to each other. So like for the square, you have four things. You can just like rotate the sphere. You can also do the thing, and like you get this. But these are both have this property, but this thing does not have this property. Does it work for uh, math? Uh, yes, yes, because uh, unitaries map. Uh, uh, yeah, they can map any uh, thing to any other thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's pure, pure transitivity. This is satisfied by both quantum theory and classical theory. Uh, we say it satisfies continuous transitivity if I can find a family of reversible transformations such that um, at, for like the first element it's just it maps omega 1 to omega 1, but then at the end of the thing it maps omega 1 to omega 2. So I'm sort of continuously rotating between two pure states. So you can see here the square does not have this property because I only have a discrete group of symmetries. But here, the sphere, if I pick a point here and I pick a point there, I just rotate between these two points. So it's a smooth way. So continuous, continuous transitivity is satisfied by quantum theory, but it's not satisfied by classical theory. Okay. Yeah, and then action 5 says that GPT satisfies continuous transitivity. Okay, so what does Hardy's reconstruction actually state in sort of theorem form? Is that if we have a GPT where um, the tomographic dimension is a function of the informational dimension, and it has the local tomography and this sort of informational local tomography, and states with limited support act like they are in smaller systems. Then, if the GPT satisfies pure transitivity, so the weaker form, uh, then the GPT where f takes the smallest possible value must be classical theory, while if we say it must satisfy continuous transitivity, then the GPT where f takes the smallest possible value is quantum theory. Okay, so like Hardy argues that like it's this is a nice thing because it allows you to go from classical theory to quantum theory with just like one extra word, namely adding this continuous. Yeah. Um, yeah, so but here the like quantum theory, what what does it mean here? It means the uh, standard. Uh, uh, yeah, it means your ordinary spaces are uh, the spaces of solution operating the complex of the space. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, basically how the proof works is. Um, it uses this filter axiom to reduce to uh, systems which have informational dimension 2. Those are like your qubit systems. Then he uses uh, this continuous transitivity to argue that this thing must be maximally symmetric, so it's sort of spherical. Um, and then he uses local tomography to show that the only spheres which like combine in a locally, tomo tomo locally tomographic manner must be three-dimensional, and then you get a qubit. That's kind of the idea of the proof. Yeah, that's the first reconstruction. And now I want to get to the second one, which uh, I would argue is the most influential one. Um, like it's the one that most people who are not very familiar with this field say is like this is the reconstruction of quantum theory. Um, and their idea is that um, we take axioms from an informational nature. So we only say things with the information, the information processing capabilities of systems. And from that we show quantum theory. So basically their thesis is that um, the universe is described by quantum theory because it's very good at processing information, or like it has very natural properties of information processing. Okay. Um, okay, so the first axiom says causality, which is sort of implicit in how I constructed the GPT framework. So mm -hmm. this for us comes for free. Okay. Um, axiom two, and this is just a direct quote from the paper. If a state is not completely mixed, i.e. if it cannot be obtained as a mixture from any other state, then there exists at least one state that can be perfectly distinguished from it. So I'm going to make this a bit more uh, concrete uh, later. Then action three is their version of like a filter action, which allows them to reduce to simpler systems. Every source of information can be encoded in a suitable physical system in a lossless and maximally efficient fashion. So again, I'm going to make this more precise later. Uh, action four is just local tomography. They pretty much all use local tomography. Um, and action five is pure conditioning, um, just a local atomic effect, and then we'll find atomic effect later, applied to a pure composite state results in a pure state. This is sort of like a preservation of purity, like if you do a, uh, yeah, 
like you did your pure states and pure measurements, if you combine them, you still have a pure state in the end. And actually, six is an interesting one. It says that every state has an essentially unique purification. So I'm going to say a bit more about, the, about what this means. So those are their axioms. You can already see it's, um, uh, it doesn't contain this like weird mathematical artifact of like, oh, it must be a function of this thing, or this is small possible function. This is already like a more natural set of axioms in a sense. Like you can argue like, I don't like these axioms, like sure, but like at least they're uh, phrased in sort of operationally sound manner. Okay, so uh, yeah, so first I'm going to explain what this means, perfect, distinct, perfect distinguishability. Um, so if I have some states that is a mixture of some other states, then I say that each of these states appearing here is a refinement of omega. It's basically, because uh, it's, yeah, uh, you can imagine if this is a mixed state and these are all pure states, then these pure states sort of contribute to omega in a certain probability. And then we define the phase identified by omega is to be a subset of states that appear in refinements of omega. So they're sort of the uh, purified versions of omega, like the more, the less mixed versions of omega. Uh, so if we... Um, but hmm? I have the... Oh, no, sorry. So for instance, if I think about, uh, if, this was, if this was my state space, then uh, the, my pure states would be on the corners. And if I have a state here, then I could, for instance, take a state here, and I could take a state here, and I can mix them, and I get the state. Mm -hmm. So these two states would be in the face of this state, mm -hmm. and the same for this thing. So in fact, this line is the face of this state. Mm -hmm. And if I'm here, then this line is the face of this state. If I'm here, then the entire space is the thing, because I can, I can take a state here, state here, and I can mix them, take a state here, state here, I can mix them. So then I get the entire state space. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and the same in the sphere. Um, yeah, you have to, there's basically two classes on the sphere, namely you have points on the outside, or you have a point on the inside, and for the inside the face is the entire space, and for the outside it's just the, the point itself. Um, so we say a state is completely mixed when the face is the entire state space. So for the, the square here, anything in the interior would be completely mixed, and the things on the boundary would not be completely mixed. And the same here, on the boundary is not completely mixed, here it is completely mixed. Uh, here in this case, the, uh, yeah, again, the completely mixed states are in, in, in the interior. So you can sort of see completely mixed is sort of a way to uh, specify they're in the interior of the state space. Mm -hmm. And in quantum theory, this corresponds to a density operator which has no kernel, so it has support on every vector. Um, yeah, so it's always the case that uh, you can never distinguish perfectly distinguish a completely mixed state from any other state, because you always have some overlap probabilities. And their axiom 2 states the converse. So if the state is not completely mixed, then there must be some state that you can perfectly distinguish from it. Okay. Um, yeah, they note, although I don't really understand the argument, that if you, um, if you have the no-restriction hypothesis, so that every, every mathematically definable effect, every mathematically definable state is also a physical state, then you get this for free. So this is sort of an operational way to state this. Or like you would say. Uh, yeah, and so a pure state is precisely those where the face only contains omega. Okay. Okay, so then their ideal compression axiom. So uh, they define a lossless compression uh, for a state, consists of an encoding operation, which like from your physical system to usually a smaller physical system, and a decoding operation goes from a smaller system to a larger system that um, preserves all your refinements. So if omega is a mixture of certain states, then those states, if I encode them and I decode them, I get exactly the same state back. Okay. Uh, another, uh, another way to say this is that um, uh, this composition of maps is the identity when you restrict to the, the subset of the phase of the state. Um, and we say compression is ideal when this system B is the smallest possible system with this property. And the way they phrase this is that this map must be surjective. So if I have any state in B, then uh, I can find a state in the face that like maps to this state. So there's no states in B that aren't reached by any state in A. Okay. And so this is their way to, uh, so the action 3 says for every state you can find ideal compression. So the way that proof works is, um, they, they take a, um, if, if, um, 
yeah, they, they take a state which has maybe support on two pure states, and then they look at, at uh, and then if they take an ideal compression for the state, then they restrict to a system which is informational dimension two. It's a qubit-like system, and then you can like do stuff with that again. So they reduce again the problem to qubits. Okay. Uh, now for the fourth action, so uh, again for this refinement, we can we can state the similar thing for effects. So we say that uh, these effects a i refined a if a is the sum of these effects. So you can again say like if a appears as a coarse grain of these effects here. Uh, we say refinements are trivial when they're all just scalar multiples of a, and a effect is atomic if it only has trivial refinements. So if you think about quantum theory, and then you're um, uh, then all your projections are types of effects, right? Your atomic projections are precisely the one-dimensional projections, so those correspond to like a pure state in, in this sense. Um, so atomic is sort of the counterpart for effects, what pure is for states. Mm -hmm. And then the axiom 5 says, and I should better draw this in a thing, if, if, I, have a, um, if I have a pure state and a composite system, so Gonna kind of draw this in like symmetric model category kind of notation. So pure state on system A and system B. And I uh, measure the system A with an atomic effect. So I apply some atomic effect A here. And this resulting thing is a state on B and distribute pure state again. So it's sort of saying like uh, pure state, pure measurement, preserved purity. Uh, a strong version of this action would be. The composition of any two atomic transformations is again atomic, which is sort of an easier way to phrase this thing, but it's a stronger version, so and they don't need it. Okay, so then the last action. Um, again, a bit more actually. Okay, so, uh, so a purif purification for a state omega. So omega is a state on the system A. Purification is a state sigma, which is on the composite system. Such that if I do the uh, trivial effect, the trivial effect one, the deterministic effect, which often is written as uh, throwing away the system, so with a ground map here, then these things should be equal to each other. So um, the intuitive way to phrase this is. If we consider pure states to be the true states of the theory, okay, and mixed states just arise from our, um, from our own uncertainty in preparing the states in the right way, then what this basically says is that uh, if we have a mixed state, then this arises from a pure state in the larger system where we don't have access to one of the systems. So this is all the environment that this system is acting on. And because we can't control the environment, because we don't know anything about it, so for us it's just like we've thrown away the system, uh, that's why we see this uncertainty and we get a mixed state here. Um, this property holds in quantum theory, and there it's often called Stein spring dilation, that you have this property. Uh, some people uh, refer to this, um, that some people that like this, they refer to this as, um, as uh, 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 the church of the higher Hilbert space, because any mixed state on a single Hilbert space arises as a pure state on a larger Hilbert space where you trace out like some like the environment system. Okay. So this is what the purification is. They state that actually states something stronger. Namely it's, it states that every state has a purification, but it also say that it must be essentially unique. So what that means is if I have two such purifications, so if I also have a pure state sigma prime which is equal to A, like this, and this uh, purifying system B is the same, then sigma and sigma pi must be connected to each other with a reversible transformation. So I must have sigma, and I apply some reversible transformation phi here, which should be equal to sigma prime. Okay, so um, it says any two ways of purifying states are like can be transformed into one another by doing some reversible transformation on the system you don't have access to. And again, this is true in quantum theory. Um, and pur uh, as I say, uh, purification does not hold in classical theory. And the reason for that is that if I have such a pure state on the composite system and I throw away one part, 
it's, it's, it's continues to be pure because you don't have any entangled states. Um, so you can, you can only purify pure states, which is a tri trivial kind of, kind of thing. Okay, is this somewhat clear? Any questions? Is the uh, get to be the same? Is the, so is the environment? Really yeah, this only holds if they are purified in the same environment. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can show from this if, if the environments are different, then you get sort of an isometry between them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh yeah. So there is a uh, sort of consequence of this action for the the, uni the uh, central uniqueness is uh, because in their way of in the way they phrase GPTs, we have a trivial system I. If you if you know about monoidal categories, it's like a monoidal unit. So it's uh, if you compose it with it, it's, it's just the same system still. And the system I has a unique pure state, um, and which means that like if I have two pure states on, on A, I can compose them with this with this unique pure state here, and I just could have the same state. So both of these states are purifications for this system. So by essential uniqueness, I get a, a pure transformation between these two things. Yeah. So this in, sorry, this implies pure pure transitivity. Yeah. Okay. So this this axiom includes the pure transitivity axiom from Hardy. So it's sort of like hidden inside this thing, which I always have found sneaky. Because like for me, the interesting thing is that you have a purification, and the essential uniqueness for me seems a bit arbitrary. But this when you are saying that you have this free of system, mm -hmm. this is not always true. Uh, yeah, but like um, the way they define a state, like a state for them is a morphism from the trivial system, which they don't write a white for, to a system A. So for them, like they need the trivial system to talk about it. Right, and that is their derivation. So they say if you have a GPT which satisfies the six axioms I just went through, then the state spaces um, must be the density operators on a complex level space. Um, and then they also show that. Um, any GPT which is causal, has local tomography, and has essentially unique purification, those theories are always completely determined by the state spaces. So if you know the state spaces, uh, then you know everything else about the theory. Then you know the, then you, then you know the dynamics, you know the effects. So like, um, uh, if you know a bit, a bit of category theory, the reason for this is because such a category is compact closed, and the compact closed category is state space determines everything else. So. Yeah. Just transformations, yeah. uh, transformation space. Because um, no, no time evolution. Uh, also that. I mean, yeah. yeah. Um, because they are transitions in the future. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but I mean, like you can, um, like the, the derivation I gave in the first lecture, like reducing Stone's theorem. Yeah. Like if you if you know like your state space and your effect space, like your the, uh -huh. your uh, yeah. time evolution sort of determined. Mm -hmm. So, for me, like I think it's impressive that they've managed to find some actions that are like at least make operational sense. But like to me, like no one would come up with these actions if they didn't know about quantum theory, right? But um, and also it does not seem to simplify it because we also have six actions in uh, of a Neumann uh, formulation of. Uh, yeah, but so the um, in that sense it doesn't simplify. That's true, but. Um, Really like a Hilbert cool. space is arbitrary in that sense. Like it, there's no operational justification for why you need to use a Hilbert space. Well, these things at least you, yeah, they are operational statements. They say something about what you can do with a system. And like if I say, oh, my system is a Hilbert space, like like that doesn't tell me what I can do with the system. And mm -hmm. this thing like like local tomography tells me if, like that I can do a certain task. Like if I, if I spread my system over two 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 different things, and, like it, it relates to experiments you can do and stuff. Yeah, so again, like I'm not arguing this is the end all be all of like the actualizations for quantum theory. But, like it's a very influential one and it's all stated in terms of information processing. And then because like their project was also that um, it's this um, uh, uh, it, it, it's uh, this uh, phrase like it from qubit, which sort of saying that like information is like the is, is like the essential currency of the universe, and we need to be able to derive quantum theory just from informational kind of uh, properties. And that's what they set up to do here. Okay. Um, okay I'm just going to go to the, to the next uh, derivation, which was published around the same time. Um, 
So they have like a slight, they have, they have, they have, they have, they have, they have a slightly different set of axioms. So the first axiom says that uh, bit-like systems, and a bit-like system is something that has informational dimension two, is finite dimensional. So this is kind of also like assumed implicitly in this reconstruction, for instance, that everything is finite dimensional. So they just state it explicitly. Action two is local tomography. Um, action three is again a, um, a filter action. So it says that uh, if I have systems or a subspace of a system uh, that are of equal informational dimension, then it must be isomorphic. And isomorphic here means I have a reversible transformation between the two systems. Um, then four says I have, I, have, I, have, I have pure sensitivity. So any two pure states are linked by a, by a transformation. And then five says we have uh, the no restriction hypothesis for bit-like systems. Although they also argue that you can replace this axiom by um, uh, by this axiom to here because of the reason that like they said that you can derive this from from uh, the notation of hypothesis. So you can also face that with that thing. Um, yeah, and then they show that these axioms are only satisfied by classical theory and by quantum theory, by complex quantum theory. Um, and that proof is quite uh, ingenious because it uses um, it uses the classification of, uh, of simple Lie groups, I think, if I remember correctly. And they also do this by, uh, they, they use this action to reduce the systems of informational dimension two. And then they use pure transitivity to argue that the space must be sphere like. And they look at different actions on the sphere and stuff. And like they use local tomography to say that the, the, that the sphere must be three dimensional. And that's on the qubit. Um, yeah, so th these are three different reconstructions by, by three independent groups of researchers. But they still have like a lot of, lot of they still have like a lot of commonalities in between. Like they all assume local tomography, and that's just needed because if you don't have anything that restricts your composite systems, the composite systems can be arbitrarily complicated things that don't relate necessarily to your simple systems. So you need some way to control your composite systems, and more importantly, it's local tomography is one of the only ways we know of to distinguish real quantum theory from from complex quantum theory. Right. So they all assume local tomography. Uh, they all assume pure transitivity, and the reason for that is that um, if you have pure transitivity, then you can you can you can uh, pick a, a a a pure state, and then I can look at sort of a a integral because like uh, your uh, your uh, your uh, your group of reversible transformations is a Lie group or a compact Lie group in the right circumstance if you have the right assumptions, and then you can like sort of take a higher integral of this group on your single pure state. And then you get a sort of an invariant mixed state that's, that's like preserved by all your reversible transformations. So this is sort of like a unique mixed state. Like if you think about a qubit with like the block sphere, this would be the state in exactly the middle of your pure state. And this is a very powerful thing to have, like an invariant state, and they can you can derive like many things using this. So they are also pure sensitivity, so they can define some invariant state and they use this in their inner group. Um, and they all have some kind of filter action. That allows them to simplify the problem so they can actually go down to like a bit like system and like derive the structure of the bit like system, show it must be a three dimensional sphere. And then they use that like to show that, okay, my larger systems contain these three dimensional spheres in this sort of like very coherent manner. And that is enough to show that they must be complex matrices on the, the sub joints of complex matrices. Um, okay, so I want now to look at the fourth reconstruction. Uh, can you tell me how much time I have left? Um, you still have. 20 minutes. No, okay. well, sorry, 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Oh, yeah. okay. Uh, okay, so I want to look at that quite a different reconstruction that sort of does this in a different manner. Um, so this paper, uh, high order interference, a single system postulates character as a quantum theory. So single system postulates here, it means that they're not assuming there are any composite systems at all. So they're only considering a single system isolation, all properties refer to a single system. So the first axiom says, uh, that the state space is spectral. So it means that um, I can write any state uh, as a combination of perfectly distinguishable pure states. So if I think about, um, uh, let's see, if I think about uh, the square, it does not have this property because if I take a, like if I have something in the middle, like I can like, take a line between the pure states and like sure I, I, I get that, but if I'm here, um, let's see, oh, like you can also go there. If you take something here, let's see, can you still write it as a mixture? Yeah, no, yeah, I think it's still in the test as well. 
Holy Convex said and so on. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this is, um, like, may, 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 maybe I've missed a detail on this actually. Like, maybe um, it needs to be a unique mixture that, that, that really pursues it. That's also not true, actually. No, no, it's not true. Anyway, this is just a, for like a property to control the, the how the state space looks like. Uh, then they assume something called pure frame transitivity, and there's a stronger version of pure transitivity, we're going to find it later. And this action is really interesting. I'm not going to formalize it because it's quite hard, but it's uh, it, it talks about an, an, an interesting property of quantum theory that not too many people know about, which is um, well, uh, I think everybody here knows about 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 the double slit experiment. Right. So if I have uh, if I have two slits and I send like my uh, particle through it, I guess of like an interference pattern here. And like the, the, the defining property of the double slit experiment is that um, I can't recover the statistics of the two slits by just looking at by combining the statistics of this one slit. So if I cover one of these things, okay. And what happens if I have a three slit experiment? Okay. Can I recover the statistics of a three-slit experiment by a combination of the, of the statistics of double-slit experiments like this and single and single slit experiments? If I cover the like, two things, mm -hmm. and the answer is yes, you can recover the the statistics of three-slit experiments just from statistics of double-slit experiments. And this is a property that they call no higher-order interference. So you have interference up to the second level, but not third level, fourth level, whatever. Uh, and they use this as an axiom to say, like, okay, my theory doesn't have this. Um, and by the way, it is possible to construct um, some toy theories that do have higher high order interference, so it's quite interesting. Um, and the last axiom is an interesting one um, it's observability of energy. And it states that I have a correspondence between the, between the dynamics of my theory and observables of my theory. Like if you think about quantum theory, you have salvage operators, and those generate your time efficiencies, right? This sort of one-to-one -one man. So they state like you must have something like this. Okay, so I'm going to say a bit more about this action two, action four. Um, so uh, a K-frame is just a set of K pure states that are that are that are that are perfectly distinguishable. And then their action says, given two K-frames. There is a reversible transformation that maps each of these elements of the frame to the other frame. So if you uh, think about quantum theory, uh, a frame would consist of, um, of, orthogonal, of orthogonal normalized vectors. And then you can take a unitary, and like if I have two such orthogonal sets of vectors of the same size, a unitary matrix, I can of course find a unitary matrix that maps one to the other. Right? So this is a property that's satisfied by quantum theory. Yeah, it's basically the strongest possible pure transitivity action. Like it relates like, like single pairs of pure states and, and, and pairs and triples. And, yeah. um, okay, and then the observability of energy requirements. So if we fix the system A, and then we denote its group of reversible transformations by G. Now under the assumptions that they have, G is a compact D group. And then we suppose that the algebra by G is not empty. So this is sort of like saying that like we have some sort of continuous uh, continuous elements in there, uh, and then each element of the, the algebra of course generates a time evolution on the state space, and also on the on the, the associated over real space, and then they call an energy observable assignment. It's an injective linear map that uh, maps each element of, these, of the algebra to an element of uh, your unit space of your observables. Such that this element is uh, conserved under its time evolution, but is not conserved under all time evolutions. Because, like, you can imagine a sort of trivial map that just maps everything to a multiple identity, and that's not interesting, it's not what you want. So, you want it to be not conserved by at least some time evolution. And then the action four says every system must have an energy observable assignment. Um, okay, so uh, it turns out that the first three actions. <coughs> Are satisfied only when the ordering space of the system is isomorphic to Rn, so to a classical system, or to a simple Euclidean Jordan algebra. But then, when you add this energy observability requirement, the only Euclidean Jordan algebras that satisfy it are the complex matrix algebras. And the reason for that is that um, what's very special about uh, matrices of uh, the space of matrices of complex numbers is that the amount of 
salvage joint operators is equal to the amount of uh, empty salvage joint operators. And that allows you sort of to make this correspondence, because the empty salvage joint operators are the ones that generate time evolutions. Well, if you think about real matrices, like for instance, two by two real matrices, the, the space of self joint matrices is three-dimensional, while the space of empty self joint matrices is one-dimensional. So they don't correspond to dimension, and that's why you can't make this energy observed with two requirements. And for and for and for and for quaternionic matrices, the problem is the opposite. So you have um, too many anti anti um, anti self joint matrices and not enough self joint matrices. Um, so interesting, interestingly, is that later. Uh, it was shown that this axiom 3, so this axiom of uh, no higher order interference, is actually not needed for this result. So if you just have a spectral state space, and we have frame transitivity, then we already get the simple Euclidean drawn algebra. This, this result, by the way, is really complicated, it's like 80 pages, and it, and it goes about like, it just uses the classification of simple Lie groups or something, and it just goes through all the, possi all the possibilities and shows like the only ones remaining are like the ones corresponding to Jordan Lutz Plus. So it's a really like complicated result. Um, uh, yeah, okay, so that's what I want to say about these like modern reconstructions. Um, like again, I'm not arguing these are the end all be all um, action response theories because I feel if we would have found those, it would be obvious. Um, <laughs> yeah. All right, so what I want to do now is I want to talk about. Um, Partial reconstruction. So I'm going to explain what I mean with that. How much time do we have? Um, you have um, eight minutes. Okay, so okay. I'm just going to see how far I get. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question basically is uh, what is special about quantum theory? Like, if you were to talk to someone about uh, like the difference in classical theory and quantum theory, like what are the things you would you would say, right? Like, what are the things you would identify as as being special to quantum theory, and like maybe you would say one of these things. You say, oh, wait, you can have like you can have like superpositional states, or you can have entangled states. Uh, the wave function collapse when you measure. You have uncertainty between like things you can observe at the same time. You can't clone quantum states if you're more of the quantum information kind. Or if you like quantum computers, you say, well, you can calculate things faster. Or if you like uh, if you like uh, if you like non say, well, you have like these normal correlations that like fly in the face of reality. Um, but then the question is like, are these special? Like, are these in fact really specific to quantum theory? So the way we can test that uh, is that yeah, if, if the universe were governed by some other non-classical theory, would we not also see these properties? And the way you can answer the question is you start with a GPT framework, you formulate a property you want to study in the language of the G of GPTs, you maybe assume some additional principles uh, to sort of, sort of constrain what you're working with. And then if you show that if the property that you're looking for holds for all such GPTs, then it's not special to quantum theory, it's just a universal feature of all such theories with these principles. Okay? So I want to go through a few of these properties and show that these are not special to quantum theory. Okay, so um, a cloning process is a process that takes copies from a single system to two copies of the system, that maps each state to two copies of the state. Okay? And quite famously, quantum theory has no cloning, so you can't clone a quantum state. But actually, classically, you also can't clone states, like if you're talking about mixed states. It's just a feature of like linearity, like if you think about like this must be a linear map, this can never be linear, so it just fills. Uh, you can clone pure states, but not mixed states. Um, a generalization of the cloning process is called a broadcasting process. So it's still a map from A to two copies of A, but now we say, um, it must only look like like my state omega if I don't have access to the other system. So if I uh, if I if I if I if I take my single system and I broadcast it to two parties, then each of these parties must agree that like yeah, what you sent me was this state. But like they can't communicate, so they don't see the whole thing. Usually, when people say that no cloning is specific to quantum, mm -hmm. they do not really talk about uh, mixed state. No, it's just yeah, about no, yeah, superposition. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I'm saying that, like, um, so I'm arguing that no broadcasting is actually a more natural property. Okay. Yeah, because uh, you do have a broadcasting process in classical theory, even, if, even when you include mixed states. But you do not have a broadcasting process in quantum theory, even if you only look at pure states. Huh. Oh, okay. um, so, yeah. and there's a theorem that shows if your GPT is causal, and your GPT sets of local tomography, then you only have a broadcasting process if your system is classical. 
So this is a universal feature of any non-classical theory, is you can't broadcast states. So this is not specific to quantum theory, it just holds whenever you go non-classical. Um, so some other properties you can show that only hold the system is classical and do not hold any other GPT, and like usually assumed is, is, uh, is causality and local tomography, is that um, uh, the state being a unique mixture of pure states, that's a property that only holds uh, in classical theory, uh, the existence of non-disturbing transformations. Um, so if you have a, 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 a measurement, for instance, or transformation that gives you information about in which state the system is prepared, if you can do that without disturbing any of the states in the system, uh, then it must be classical. So any non-classical theory disturbs some states. It says you, you, uh, you can't get information for free in this sense. So yeah, a cloning process that can clone all pure states is also a pure classical property. So if you're if you if you have a system where you can clone all pure states, it must must have been a classical system to start with. Um, if you have a measurement that can perfectly distinguish all pure states, it must have been classical to start with. So this is sort of um, a way to phrase um, the universality of Heisenberg uncertainty, namely that you can never uh, know all the pure states at the same time. You can never like perfectly distinguish in like all the information in your system. Um, yeah. If you have a few more assumptions, so uh, this is the same people that did the, 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 the second reconstruction. Um, you have causal GPT with local tomography, and you have essential uniqueness of purification. Then it has the following properties. So it is not classical, so in particular all the properties of the first slide do not hold. Uh, you have maximally entangled pure states. <clears throat> um, so these are basically what it means is you have a, a composite pure state where um, if I do a measurement, if I do the same measurement on both sides, I get the same outcomes. Um, uh, they formulate a, a state teleportation protocol. So state teleportation you can do in any of such theories. Um, yeah, every process can be dilated to reversible transformations. Also, property quantum theory has, but like if you don't know what dilation is, that doesn't really mean much to you. And also you have a, a no-bit commitment theorem and a no-programming theorem. Those are also like results of quantum theory, things you can't do in the quantum system. So those also hold in this general setting. Uh, okay, so another thing that like would be like sort of you think about when you think about quantum theory is like phases and phase groups and stuff. So we can define what it means, what, what phases are in the GPT. Uh, is that if I fix some measurements uh, that perfectly distinguish just a maximal set of states. Right? Then they can look at its phase group. And this consists of all reversible transformations that do not affect any of the measurement outcomes. Okay? So they, whatever the state the system is in, I get the same measurement outcomes if I apply the reversible transformation or not. It turns out in quantum theory, if I take my measurement to consist of just um, a measurement on a computational basis, then the phase group uh, consists exactly of the diagonal matrices with phases on them. So this is kind of why we call this uh, the phase group. So this would be like uh, U1 to the end. Okay. And it turns out that um, a GPT has non-trivial phase groups. So sort of reversible transformations that do not affect uh, the measurement outcomes. If it is non-classical. So this is again a universal property for any non-classical theory. Okay. Uh, now, it's not, now it's like a different one. Um, this is called uh, uh, the, the CHSH game. See if this stands for four names uh, Klaus, Horner, something, something. Mm -hmm. um, so, this is sort of like a, 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 a game where you have an advantage if you have quantum theory as opposed to classical theory. So, if I have two parties, Alice and Bob, and uh, they are together in the same lab, and they can communicate with everyone, they can, they, can, they can discuss strategies, they can exchange like states, they can prepare some complicated state, and then each take a part of it. Okay? And then when they're apart and they can no longer communicate, then Eve gives both Alice and Bob a randomly chosen bit. So he gives, uh, he gives Alice a 0 or 1 and he gives Bob a 0 or 1. Now Alice must reply to Eve with some bit, some response, and Bob must reply to Eve with some response. Okay, just some bit. And Alice and Bob win if the XOR of the bits they reply with is equal to the product of the bits they gave. So if they both got, uh, if they, neither of them, uh, sorry, if, um, if one of them got a zero, then they need to reply with the same bit. Well, if both of them got a one, then they, then they need to reply with different bits, okay? 
And the question is, what is the maximal probability that Alice and Bob can win this game? Okay. Well, it turns out classically is a very easy strategy. If they always reply zero, then they win, then they win 75% of the time. Okay. It doesn't matter if they share some big strategies on this, this is a very easy strategy. Um, if they share what's called a non-signaling box, so it's some sort of correlated state um, that still respects causality, uh, but it has a very powerful correlation in it, so they can do something on their side and it sort of correlates very strongly on the other side. Then it turns out they can win perfectly, they can win all the time. Okay. Interestingly, if they share a quantum state, they can only win about 85% of the time. Okay, so there is this constant 2 plus square root of 2. It's known as the as the, as the Tyrrellson bound. Um, and for a very long time was the question, uh, okay, so quantum mechanical correlations are stronger than classical correlations, but they're not as strong as they hypothetically could be. Like, that's very weird. Okay? So people have wondered, like, can we, can we like, find some nice reason why this must be this bound? Okay, and it took a very long time, but like in 2009, some people proposed a way you can actually get these correlations out of it. So this is a quote from that paper, which is the principle of information causality. Okay, they say, the information gain that Bob can reach about a previously unknown to him data set of Alice, by using all his local resources and n classical bits communicated to Alice, is at most n bits. So it means like, if I communicate n bits to Alice, I can... Um, so it, I can at most get n bits of information out of this. Like, um, like you sort of say, like, I communicate n bits and we have like a shared state, and then based on those n bits, Alice does something to her state, and that affects like the measurement outcomes I get if I measure my state, but I can never get more information out of it than the information I gave to Alice. Okay, that's the principle of information causality. Um, the actual formal definition uses the concept of mutual information, okay, which is a bit hard to define. And I want to note that if you take m is zero, this is just the principle of no signaling, that you can't get free information from the other side, which would break causality. So this is a stronger version of saying that we have causality between bodies. Now it turns out that um, if you have a GPT that satisfies information causality, again like in formalized and appropriate manner, then they can win the CHSH game with maximal probability 2 plus square root 2 over 4. So this is the same value as quantum theory. So you can say the reason we get these, this particular strength of bipartite uh, correlations, quantum theory, is because quantum theory satisfies information causality. Um, and like, um, I, tried, uh, I tried reading a bit about it. Apparently this only holds for bipartite um, correlations. There's still open questions about multipartite correlations. If you have like a three-party game, this doesn't fully explain like the correlation of quantum. So there's something that we need to have something better than this, something uh, stronger. <coughs> Okay, uh, I think it's the last thing I want to say. Um, so it's about, this is about the computational power of quantum theory. Okay, so uh, the complexity class BQP is the class of problems we can efficiently solve if we have access to a quantum computer, and the class BPP is problems we can solve when we have access to a to a to a to a to a, to a, to a probabilistic classical computer, and we expect that BQP is bigger than BPP. So this, hopefully, we can efficiently solve problems with a quantum computer we can't do with a classical computer. It turns out the best known bound for this class BQP is a class called AWPP, which stands for Almost Wide Polynomial or Probabilistic Polynomial. It's a very weird class. You can look the definition of Wikipedia, but it won't help you. Um, <laughs> but it contains, for instance, the problem of graphs, a graph isomorphism, which is still unknown if it is in BQP. Okay? Uh, it turns out that this bound AWPP is actually the bound of any GPT satisfying local tomography. And this is even not assuming causality in GPT. So this AWPP is of a universal upper bound to all these things. So it sort of says that like quantum theory might be strong in classical theory, but an arbitrary other physical theory is, won't be much faster than quantum computers. So uh, the speciality of, of, of the computational power of quantum theory is not super special in this sense. Um, I just want to say that like uh, 2019, they also found a GPT that actually reaches the bound of AWPP. It's actually quite an interesting model. It's a model of Turing machines where instead of being probabilistic, it's an affine uh, Turing machine. So your, uh, your state transitions are labeled by a, by a real number instead of a number between 0 and 1. 
but with condition that your uh, final branch must have probability one if you sum all the things. So it's a quite an interesting model. Uh, yeah. So what is special about quantum theory? Well, uh, we saw all these things, and like they're not really special. So I don't. Yeah, I don't really know what's special about quantum theory actually. Uh, <laughs> but <clears throat> I mean, if I may a comment, when mm -hmm. we're looking for what's special about quantum theory, mm -hmm. usually it's in direct comparison with classical theory. Here you are, you, you are saying that it's not special with respect to other GPDs, mm -hmm. but this is a bit arbitrary uh, to um, me. It's, so um, I would argue that like, if you look at the space of possible universes, right? mm -hmm. if I say quantum is special, it must mean that like the uh, fraction of the, the the possible universes that have the properties the quantum theory has must be small with respect to all the possible universes. Yeah, but it's it's not as if I mean I think weird to to think this way because quantum theory has not been picked up randomly from a set of possible universes. Mm. It's just what there is. Yeah. Yes, and yes. if we want to understand quantum theory, what I'm interested in is uh, I, I want to understand in how different it is from the world I am familiar yeah. with. Yeah. So how yeah. is different it is yeah, yeah. from from I think that, 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 that that's that mm. this is a valid position to have, yeah. of course. But yeah. uh, I hope you also see that like it might be interesting to like look at these hypothetical mm. alternatives and yeah, see yeah. that like they're actually not that different. Mm. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and of course, like most of these things I talked about are qualitative, not quantitative. If you look at quantities, then like of course you will find differences. But, uh, yeah. Okay. So um, sorry, this lecture uh, we saw a few different reconstructions, and although. None of them are ideal. It is like interesting to see the similarities between them and like find out like okay, so which properties are needed to find like a mathematical proof of structural quantity. And like sort of they, they sort of seem to converge on like a few things that are really important, like local tomography or the fact that you can that you can transform pure states to each other, um, like this kind of stuff. And we saw that many that, that, that many qualitative properties of quantum theory are in fact general properties of any non-classical theory. Okay, uh, and I think I'm out of time. So we don't leave it here.